So I'm basically going to talk about the history of MySQL and Maria. So uh, I'm actually going to talk about some of the early stuff here, the history behind this thing. So, so back in the day, there was a guy called Montevidenius, who's the chap here in the picture. And uh, he created the first version of MySQL. I mean, it wasn't called MySQL, it was called Unireg back in 1983. And at the time, he created it because he was a consultant, he had customers, they needed databases, and he hated paying, you know, Oracle and these guys. So he was like, why don't I just create my own, and then I, and I, then I sell my own to my customers. And that worked fine, and he reused the database for multiple customers. And then in 91, the platform this database was running on was end of life. The company said, we're not, we're done. So he was like, okay, now my project, my own database is dead. So his friend David Axnark convinced him that hey, you should, you should, uh, you should create this as an open source project that should be on Linux, and that's kind of how how MySQL came to be. So they decided, all right, it's true, we've been using a lot of lot of uh, open source tools, so let's give back, let's release MySQL as an open source database, and let's create let's create this on Linux. So in 1994 first version of MySQL was released. And it had actually a logo like that. Has anyone seen that logo before? The MySQL, that's the first logo of MySQL back in 94. Uh, pretty, pretty ugly actually. And then in 95 they actually found the company MySQL AB. And of course this was very good timing because it was the same time the internet kind of exploded. So MySQL was there at the right place at the right time. Uh, and the LAMP stack became the thing. Everyone who had a website had the LAMP stack. So every, MySQL was running pretty much all the websites. It was free, it was open source, it fit with Linux, Apache, and, and PHP. So those the early days. Uh, MySQL AD, the company was small. There was like seven people, all of them engineers. Some, I mean, the only thing they ever saw was support. So they sold support contracts, and that's it. Uh, then in 99 they released MySQL 323, which was kind of the first good version of MySQL, uh, which is a major milestone. And uh, MySQL still had a problem though, they had no transactions. So people who were using Postgres and stuff were saying, well, MySQL is just a toy, there's no transactions. So at the same time as Monty had been developing MySQL, this guy called Heikki. Tuli in Finland. He had been developing a database as part of his PhD in a, a university in Finland. Uh, and he wanted to sell his database to Oracle. And he came to Oracle with his database and they kind of laughed in his face. Like, what is this? Yeah. You think we need another database? So he came to Monty instead and said, hey, I have this database engine. It does transactions, as it compliant. Do you think we would plug it into MySQL? And MySQL said, well, let's try. And they tried. And, and Eventually, in 2000, InnoDB was released as part of MySQL, uh, MySQL Max. InnoDB at the time was already 10 years old. It had been a project for 10 years when it was uh, released in MySQL. I mean, pretty much anyone uh, using MySQL now uses InnoDB. Who uses InnoDB here? Or who doesn't? What do you use? Something simple. No, do you use something else? Do you use it? Yeah. At the time, my eyes on was, was the engine that everyone used. It was the default. And InnoDB was only part of MySQL Max, so you had to a special down, download which had extra features in the InnoDB. For everyone using the standard 323, you used my eyes on, no transactions, uh, table level locking, and so forth, no crash, crash recovery, nothing. So compared to I don't know, proper databases, not a very good solution. But Still, it was enough for the web. A bit like, a bit like the NoSQL databases are today. They're not proper, but they're enough for, for many use cases. Uh, then in January 2001, MySQL 323 became GA, but perhaps a more important uh, event at the same time was that Morton Nikos, the CEO of MySQL, joined. So prior to 2001, the CEO had been Monty, the developer. He was a great developer, perhaps not such a great CEO. I mean, 
he's not here, but if you, he would probably argue against me. But it was a good decision to take someone who had more business insight as a CEO. So at 2001, the company started really growing as well because more than because became the CEO. And well, uh, the company started growing. Another really important event in 2001 was that I joined the company. I didn't put it here, but it's, it's fairly, fairly important. And then, well, things started flowing. MySQL grew. The use, use, usage of MySQL just grew. Uh, MySQL got more money. MySQL got more users. We got 4.0. It was released in 2003. Uh, 4.1, 2004. And 4.1 added uh, um, subqueries, which was a major feature at the time. MySQL did not have subqueries until 4.1. They were added in 4.1, uh, but as many who have, have used them know, the performance was fairly abysmal to say the least. So they were added just to have the checkbox. We have subqueries, and then the user we so should we use these subqueries? You're like, God, no, we don't use them. They're abysmal, but they're there. So we have it on the checkbox. Right, so things were looking bright for my as well at this time. We're now in 2004. Things are great. Uh, then things start, uh, other things start happening that are not so great for MySQL. In October 2005, Oracle, yes, the big O, acquired this company called InnoBase, which was the company who was producing InnoDB. And that, of course, was not so, so well perceived at MySQL because InnoDB was growing to become the engine, and suddenly Oracle acquired them. So the, it was uh, actually at MySQL AB, this was called Black Friday because it was a Friday when this was announced. So quite a few meetings were had. Uh, MySQL 5.0 was about to go GA, and, and our biggest engine was just acquired by Oracle. So we had quite a few meetings inside in the company and what to do, and our marketing team came up with a great idea to say, let's call this pluggable storage engines, so that you can just add or remove storage engines on the fly. And we did a marketing campaign about this, and well, the most important thing was actually that Oracle just continued to do business as usual. They acquired InnoDB, but they didn't change anything. The work together with Inno, Inno InnoDB developers continued as before. So actually, it did not change anything for MySQL or for the end user. We just had to pay Oracle instead of paying InnoDB, but they didn't really increase the prices. They didn't change the way of, way of working. So in, in the end, it wasn't a big event, but at the time, quite a few people uh, were panicking. Uh, so, we just plowed along, uh, the development, development or the engineering organization got bigger and bigger, you know, MySQL is a virtual company, or was, MySQL was a virtual company, people work from home, no real offices, communication through email, through whatever, chat, IRC at the time, and things like that, which works fine when you're a small company, but when your development org is 50 people, it's not as easy anymore to have, have a virtual organization. And well, it started showing, you know, development was more fragmented and stuff like that. So it kind of grew too big. In my opinion, I wasn't, you know, I was there, but not, not as a developer. But then in 2008, something happened. Uh, MySQL used to have, com have company meetings in the beginning when we were small. So every year the whole company goes to, a, goes to one place. You get to meet people, you get to shout at the people you want to shout at and, and talk to the people you want to talk to. Which is very important for a virtual company again, because if you don't see people, it's easy to get disconnected, right? But if you see them once a year, you know, you can shout, you can talk, you can drink, whatever you need to do with your people. However, we stopped in 2004. We stopped doing that because we're too big, because we're over 100, so it's like costing quite a bit to have this company meeting. But in 2007, it was decided to have one more, and it was in January 2008. All the employees were shipped to Orlando. Uh, we arrived, first day, first meeting, and we have a direct connection to Sun, and the CEO of Sun tells us they just acquired MySQL. So the meeting kind of changed uh, a bit. Uh, half of the employees went drinking, and the other half uh, tried to actually be nice to the Sun people. But anyway, MySQL AB was acquired by a billion, which is a fairly good, good amount of money. 
And well, it was actually not a, not a very bad match because Sun was doing a lot of open source stuff, so it did fit quite well with my I was doing. Uh, however, Monty, the founder, who was two slides ago, he didn't like working with Sun very much. So he, didn't, he wanted his own organization, doing things his own way, and he was arguing with the guy. So eventually, in 2008, he left Sun. He created his own company called Monty Program, and a few developers joined him. And the idea was to do, to do, they were working on a storage engine for MySQL, to do work for Sun, but as a separate company, just to be able to have their own rules and not the bureaucracy of the big company. However, one important event here is missing. It's the crash in 2008. And it's important because it, it was important to Sun. So Sun was doing okay until 2008. And after that, Sun was not doing very okay at all. So, so in April 2009, we were having a MySQL Users Conference in Santa Clara. A lot of MySQL people were there. First day, I wake up, I lift up my phone, I have 27 missed calls and 54 SMSs because Oracle had, to, Oracle had just acquired Sun. So same thing, we have a lot of users there, we don't know what to tell them because we don't know anything about this acquisition. So same story, I mean a bit bigger but still. It turns out Oracle only paid 7.4 billion for Sun which is not as much if you compare it to what Sun paid for MySQL but still. Uh, that changed quite a few things. For example, it changed Monty Program's goal. So Monty Program had been, had been founded to just work on a side project for MySQL, a storage engine. As soon as Oracle acquired Sun, they decided, all right, we should actually create a fork or a branch of MySQL. And this is kind of how MariaDB was, was created. More question. Oracle was not then Monty Program itself. Same way. with Oracle Monty program actually they were fighting against this acquisition and so forth so it took a long time and in December Oracle made public promises about MySQL things that for five years it would remain open for five years it would be blah 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 they had like a list of ten things and this finally convinced the European Union to let the deal pass so Sun was acquired by Oracle and it's interesting because it was in December 2009, which means that all these five-year promises will end in 2014, December. So, yeah. well, I'm not saying anything, but who knows what's going to happen to my scale after that. Right. So, what happened after that? Well, in 2010, MariaDB 5.1 was released, our first alpha version, so the first version of the fork. Uh, which was good, except that, well, it took quite a while to get recognition and stuff, but, but there you go. And then, at the same time, other things started happening. So, MySQL 5.5 was released by Oracle, which is great, but what they also did is, was that they released closed source modules. So, they released MySQL 5.5, uh, there was a community edition and an enterprise edition. And in the enterprise edition, you had modules that were no longer part of the community edition. So you had your first closed source features in MySQL. Now, the first thing MariaDB did, of course, was to look at these closed source modules and code the same functionality in MariaDB as open source modules. So you can still get them as open source, but you, just, but you have to move to Maria. They are no longer in, in MySQL communication. Uh, then in August 2012, Oracle Closed. Well, they had already started closing the bugs database, but they started closing test cases were no longer released, and so forth. So 
this uh, kind of pissed off the Linux distributions because they want to have openness, they want to know what's going on in a new version of MySQL, what, what are the test cases, which bugs are fixed, which bugs are not fixed, and this information was no longer available. And this is kind of the reason why in February, Fedora and OpenSUSE announced that they're going to replace MySQL with MariaDB in their distributions because MariaDB is open, the bugs database is open, test cases are open, and so forth. And MySQL no longer provides this. Is there another, anyone else call, call it? Fedora and OpenSUSE? Sent to us in one replace by the ship. also probably ship. Yeah, but any clear replacements between on these two? Well, there's a few others like Chakra Linux. Yeah. We, use, we use them on the website. Yeah. By the way, the 2008 date is actually correct. There's a press release on the MySQL and Fedora that was in December 16th that they officially announced the storage engine. So the simple ability is right for actually to be. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what, what were they shooting before that? Then? For Cronus and all that? The patches, the Facebook and Google patches. That's the, that's the scam, right? They didn't do anything, they just packaged it. Before that, they just did the Cronus patch set. Interesting. Yeah. I always thought that the, the patch set included actually, you know, they just didn't call it. Just look at my slides, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Monty program, actually, Monty program was founded much earlier. Monty program was the first company that backed the Okay, yeah, that's true. That's true. I agree with you at that point. But Monty left. Monty left in December, I, I can show you that. He made his famous blog post in December. And he left in December. And then he was forced to leave then. Yeah. <laughs> we all have died in the evening. I left and spent the rest of the other people. <laughs> Anyway, so that's the storyline, kind of the history lesson. I did it really fast to be able to give Colin more time. Uh, does anyone have any question about this? Yeah. Well, why is it important that there's a MariaDB foundation? Why that organization? Uh, so of just a corporation. So yeah, so MariaDB currently is, is it's a project, right? There's a company called Monty Program, which does most of the development work, but it doesn't really own the project. The project is, is open. Uh, I think around 60% of all the MariaDB captains are from Monty Program, but 40% are from outside. So the foundation is kind of a government, a governing body for the whole project. And it also, it also makes sure that if uh, the companies are acquired, there's still an external governing body. So that, for example, the Oracle MySQL acquisition cannot happen again. Copyright. It's shared copyright. Anyway, but it's GPL, so it's shared copyright between between uh, the coders and developers and the and the companies. But it's a GPL anyway, so it's open source license. Well, as long as it's still yes. So I mean, but that's 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 how MariaDB can exist. The ability to do commercial licenses. That is gone. It's gone. But the MariaDB cannot do commercial licenses. It's GPL only. It's GPL. Yes. Because it's it's based out of the Oracle MySQL. Oracle owns the copyright for the for the core MySQL code. Mm -hmm. So they are the only ones who could do any other license than GPL. Unless you rewrote that code. Unless you rewrote that code, which no one will. So the commercial licenses are pretty much gone. But they're pretty much not needed anymore anyway. Because, I mean, it's less and less <coughs> because it's, it's software as a service. Where do you, I mean, bundling software packages is less happening less and less. Yeah. So it's, the commercial license is kind of a dying business. You don't agree? The world has changed in less than my working lifetime. Any other questions about this? Yes, I can hold on. There is a bullet uh, 2013 February about uh, 5.6. Yes. Why do you include that bullet? What is the significance of that? Uh, well, it's actually just because it happened to happen. But it, I mean, it will, it will come in the kind of in Colin's presentation a bit, but in mine as well. Uh, so 5.6. Well, I'm going to talk about it later. We talk about. I'm going to talk about a bit the difference between Maria and, and MySQL. So see how to go together. And 5.6 will be different than the previous versions of, of them. So if you look, 
Well, I was going to go through this, but this is perhaps not important. It's like the code and stuff. It's a different project. But uh, during MySQL AB time, there was a project for MySQL 6.0, which was still living on the sun. And then Oracle kind of stopped it. And they released 5.6 instead. But many of the features in MariaDB actually stem from this 6.0 co uh, project back in the early days. And many of the Oracle and Maria 5.5 features also go back to the 6.0 project. Right. So this is perhaps not so interesting this time, per se. Uh, so. so if you look at the MariaDB, so MariaDB started uh, as a fork of MySQL 5.1, which was released, uh, the first release Sunday, I mean the only release Sunday actually, before they were part of Oracle. Right. And then MariaDB continued adding stuff to this. So 5.1 was, was a, a fork or a branch of, of MySQL 5.1. Uh, but because MySQL traditionally had really long development cycles, and MariaDB just wanted to get features out more often, so they add, did additional release. So Maria, there's Maria 5.2, 5.3, which are still based on 5.1, but they just had multiple releases. And then uh, Oracle released MySQL 5.5, so then Maria, Maria did merge their features from 5.3 with MySQL 5.5 and had Maria 5.5. So Maria 5.5 is MySQL 5.5 plus all the Maria features. Okay. So I'm still answering your question about 5.6. I'm going to. So Maria 5.5 is MySQL 5.5 plus all the additional Maria features. Uh, they just released 5.6. And I mean, Colin will talk about it more, but 5.6, they've changed quite a bit of the structure of the, of the, of the internal structures in the, in the files and stuff. So doing another merge would be really complicated. So the MariaDB team has decided not to merge anymore. Instead, they're doing their own code base that is called Maria 10.0. It's based out of Maria 5.5. And then they will port the features from MySQL 5.6 into their own code base. So instead of doing the other way around, they're taking features from MySQL 5.6 into Maria. Previously, they did the opposite. They took MySQL 5.5 uh, 5, 5, and they took the Maria features into 5.5. 5, 5. Now they're doing the opposite. So that's why there's a, it's a kind of a significant. And the features that are, they're adding in 10.0 are also even more. They have even more advanced features. So it's, Colin will talk more about it. Right. So if we look at the 5.5, five, uh, which is the, still the Maria, the GA of Maria. MySQL just released their 5.6 GA. Uh, but if you look at 5.5, Maria compared to, to MySQL 5.5, the feature list is very long. There's a lot of features in Maria 5.5 that are not in MySQL 5.5. Now, some of these features have been implemented in MySQL 5.6, uh, but they were already around for several years in Maria, so it's kind of how you should compare this, but, but they've been around longer in Maria than in MySQL. Some of these features still have existed in, in MySQL. For example, the first thing is, of course, uh, MySQL 5.5 had the closed source features, and Maria has the same, but as open source features. Of course, they're not coded the same way, because the code is closed source, but they're doing the same thing in MySQL. Then, I don't know if, I mean, there's a lot of features here, I'm not going to go through all of them. Colin, do you talk about these features, the ones already from 5.5? Okay, well, that's okay. So we have additional storage engines that, that uh, isn't, are not available in, in MySQL, like ARIA, Federated X. Well, ARIA is interesting, actually. So we talked about MyISM before. That was traditionally the engine. And MyISM is a very simple engine. It's like, uh, it's like a flat file for the data. And then there's an index file, right? And it's really, uh, I mean, it has table level logs. So you write anything. Everything is locked, and you know it's not very good for concurrency and stuff. And the biggest problem, with, but it's good for certain use cases, like more like kind of data warehousing where you don't really have to need a data warehouse, but you need to store like simple stuff like logs or things like that. It's very structured. It's simple. Uh, it can be very useful for that. But the biggest kind of problem with, with MySQL is there's no crash recovery. Right? If a server crashes during a write, your table will be in an inconsistent state, and that's it. You have to do something. So ARIA is basically my ISA plus trash recovery because it has a log. So if the statement is in the middle of a write, 
they can actually roll back that to that line. So you actually get crashing code. So that's why, uh, even if you don't use it, I mean, MySQL, is my, uh, my ISAM is still used for all uh, uh, implicit, all temporary tables used for solve queries. Internally, they use memory, the memory engine in my ISAM. So in, in Maria, you use ARIA and my ISAM. Then there's some other cool features, microsecond support that MySQL didn't have. Uh, the statistics are pretty cool. So on MySQL you have lots of statistics. If you do show show status on the MySQL, you see a lot of statistics about the server, but all the statistics is server per server, right? So you don't get anything for table or for user or something like that. So uh, it can be hard to do any kind of useful. I mean, if you want to know it, uh, how is, there, is this table very, very used and, and whatnot, you cannot do it. You can only look at the server as a whole. But with these tables, you actually get specific statistics per table, per index, or per user. So that's very useful for DBAs. If you have large, large, for example, we have a, a customer with a lot of a lot of tables. And I was talking to their DBAs uh, a while back, and I was asking so, and they were we were talking about. The fact that their, their developers are allowed to do pretty much anything, and the DBAs kind of have to clean up the mess. And so I was like, so how do you know if the table is used? Where's the documentation? They were like, well, we don't have it because they're you know fast moving, no one writes anything down and whatnot. So I was like, so how do you know it? And it's like, well, if the table looks like it's not used, we actually rename it, and if no one complains, we, we drop it after two weeks. I was like, okay, but if you had these features, you would need to do that if we know the table is used. But that's how they do it there, because they're, they're actually transitioning to Maria, but they haven't done it fully yet. But, but it's also more useful to see is an index actually used. We have an index, but is it actually used or not? You get statistics per index. Uh, some other features, so virtual columns, that's a feature that was requested a lot at MySQL. Or virtual, I mean, functional indexes was the feature that was requested a lot. But virtual columns allow you to have functional indexes. So virtual columns means that you add a column to a table which is a function of the pre previously existing columns and then you can index that column. So it allows you to create kind of functional index but you have to have the column there. Uh, Sphinx, does anyone know what Sphinx is? Okay, no one, I don't have to talk about it. It's a to-do search. MySQL have, has full text search for my eyes on and in 5.6 for InnoDB, but the full-text search is not very good. I mean, it's, it's okay, but if you read, you need a powerful search, use something else, and Sphinx is, is something else, and my, uh, MyRealDB has, an, has uh, Sphinx as a storage engine, so you can access Sphinx through the MySQL okay. so that's pretty cool. And some other things here. Uh, one of my favorite features, actually, is progress report for alter table. So in my as an alter table is until 5.6 when some operations are online. The alter table is done in the worst possible way. So if you do any kind of alter table, MySQL starts by creating a new table with the new structure and then copying everything from the old table to the new structure. And during this entire operation, everything is locked. Right? So even if you want to add an index, your table is locked during this operation. And it can take a huge amount of time. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is you have no idea how long it's going to take. You start and it just it starts and it takes a minute. And you're like, okay, should I cancel? Should I, what should I do? You're like, you don't know. So with the progress report, you actually know. You see after 10 minutes, okay, it's only done 10%. Okay, I'll, I'll cancel. You won't be like, oh, 10 minutes, but what if it's going to take 11? You know, I should, you know. Here you know. You don't have to worry about it. You know how far it's progressed. You know approximately how long it's going to take. So that's a pretty cool feature for DBA. You stand on MySQL, you don't have this. You alter, and you wait, and you wait. And the group commit feature is, is very cool. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you care about your data, I mean, if you have a, a, like demands on the durability of your data and stuff, then you need to, uh, when you commit, your data, you have to make sure it's, it's written to disk somewhere, right? So that your commits are durable. And in MySQL, we have the redo log for InnoDB, and there's a binary log for for uh, uh, the use for backup and stuff, which is uh, for the whole server and not only InnoDB. 
And when you do a commit, you have to make sure that these writes are synced. So that when you write to the InnoDB read log, you at the same time write to the binary log. So that uh, if you have a crash, both are consistent. Right. And that kind of creates a problem because it becomes easily becomes a disk bottleneck because you have to write these two to disk in a synchronized manner. So you have a lot of writes. Your IO, disk IO, easily becomes your bottleneck because you have to wait for these guys to be done in, se in sequence. So the group commit, what it does is that it groups together several commits waiting to be committed into one uh, testing operation. So for any disk-bound uh, uh, traffic, this has huge performance impacts. Uh, I don't have the, the uh, graphs with me. Facebook did some tests, and, and uh, if you Google Facebook group commit, my MySQL group commit, you will get tests by Facebook, and it's pretty impressive the results. It's up to up to a third times faster with group commit than without. Uh, so one of the cool things in, my, in MariaDB, so MariaDB added some NoSQL features, like uh, a handler socket, which basically allows you, allows you to do to directly access your storage engine. So certain operations might be faster. So basically MySQL has like a layer, there's a Parser, if you really simplify, there's a parser optimizer storage engine. Right. And every time you do a query, you have, it has to be parsed, it's then optimized, and then, you, then it's actually sent to the storage engine. Uh, with handler socket, you basically skip the parser and the optimizer, you directly speak to the storage engine. And this, if you have large, uh, uh, simple operator, uh, a huge batch of simple operations, simple operation, it can be faster to just do it through this interface. So it allows you direct access to the storage engine. So you can do crude operations. So create, replace, update, and delete. Uh, another cool thing besides Skype is uh, dynamic columns. Uh, basically, I mean, you know NoSQL, right? The idea is that you can, in many of the document stores, one of the ideas is that you can uh, uh, have a dynamic set of attributes. So a row doesn't have a fixed set of attributes, but uh, which attribute a row has depends on what's in the row, right? So for example, if you have a huge store, you sell a multi multitude of things. Uh, some things might have a screen, others might not. So whether the attribute screen size is there or not depends on what the actual object is, right? And one of the benefits of using uh, a NoSQL thing is that, well, you can have a flexible schema. You don't have to define a column screen size. And then you, somewhere else, you can do joins, if and so forth. So basically, you can do the same thing in MariaDB. You can say, okay, this, so it looks like a, it looks like a table, but you just define one column as a blob, binary large uh, whatever object. And then using these transformations, you, uh, or these functions, you can say, okay, I'm going to define these attributes and each row can decide whether it has this attribute or not and which property it has for that attribute. It allows you to do a very flexible uh, storage of data in a similar way to NoSQL. You still have to use SQL to get the data, but you can use this function to have a flexible set of attributes. So that's pretty good. And then they added a lot of optimizer features. Uh, uh, the main Cool feature here is, is subquery optimization. So I said in 4.1 we added subqueries with absolutely no optimization whatsoever. Every subquery was done in the worst possible way because it was the easiest. And this is the first time they, they were actually optimized was in MariaDB 5.5. And the main optimization was that was that many I mean, the query, subqueries that could be rewritten to joint were actually done so by the optimizer. So previously, if, I mean. I used to be training a consultant at MySQL, and, and the first thing we used to say to customers like, okay, do you use subqueries? I never said yes, they said, okay, well, let's rewrite them to joint, because they're gonna be several thousand times faster. But now, this is not the case anymore. Now it's the same speed, whether it's a joint or something. So that's a very cool feature. So that's actually a feature where all you have to do is start using it, and some of your queries will, like, might actually be faster just by using what you're doing, because the optimizer will optimize it better. And there are some other optimizations. I'm way past my time. Uh, any question about these features I've talked about so far? Does 
anyone find any of these features useful? No. What? Yeah. Software optimization useful? Anything else? No one likes the NoSQL features? Uh, can you index? You mean do index a specific attribute? Yeah. No. Is that what you, you would like to do that? I think that it completes the package of saying, you know, I can comment. Yeah. I think it's still very useful. Yeah. Have, have you have you used them or? You... Um. No. I I work on mobile for Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I use the pattern columns. You uh, use them? Okay. So basically, it's very simple to say that yeah. like wave blocks, uh, whether it's a click or, or maybe a series of something, some events, uh, the attributes depends on the type. Yeah. They have some common set of uh, attributes, so then it depends on the event type. Some so other like events may have more yeah. attributes than others. So I package the extra uh, the events per time per event yeah. in, in the pattern account. Uh, actually, one feature that's coming with 10.0, what this is, so up to now, you can only access the attributes by number. But in 10.0, you can name them. So you can give a, a name to an attribute. In 5.5, five, five, it's all number. That will, uh, that will actually answer the question, yeah. If you use a function, a virtual column that has a function that accesses specific data from, a, from the uh, uh, dynamic column, then you can, who you have, yeah. then you can actually achieve well, it. Would that be used as a sparse index, though? So since the dynamic column is not going to be in every row, and so rows that don't have that column shouldn't appear in the index at all, right? Would well, that happen if you use a virtual column? Well, it depends. So, I mean, Every row, if you use a virtual column, <coughs> yeah. every row will have a value. The value could be empty. Yeah. Or not. Yeah, so the, that's, it's close. It's still huge. It could be able to index on the column. Yeah. For most cases, that's, that's fine. But another attribute of like, indexing of flexible schema is that you can have small schemas. Yeah. But then it's up to the optimizer to know which what is it useful not to use an input file. But I mean, it will never replace the, uh, the NoSQL uh, stuff. It just kind of well, gives you some of the. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's, not like the, it's not like the single node terms are bringing that much more to the table data model wise. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it will, but yeah. it's going to put some of the features, I mean, it's just some of the features, I mean, kind of, I guess some of the. Use cases where you say, okay, you, have, you should go, you should go this way because that, because well, you can actually also do it here. So it gives you, uh, I say, it kind of just takes away some of the, of the benefits of, of using uh, uh, NoSQL. I'm curious, what, what is the disk access optimization or what was happening before? What's, what's gotten better? Uh, what's gotten better in disk access? I actually don't remember. I have the slides pending, but I can't, I don't actually remember. Colin, do you remember what disk access optimization yeah, is? Yeah, index expedition push down, MR, let me give you a viewer. Disk index, I remember, I remember that. Well, so, well, index expedition push down is one. So, that if you have an additional. Slash query dash optimization. I have my other slides that I have to link. Oh. So, I'm not going to use it because this is a short one. <coughs> Any other questions? But I mean, any of the stuff. No? I'm curious about the group commit implementation. Yeah. So it's like a single thread and you can write a log and you just pop things. Like, how, do you, how does the thread that's the right dead log notify waiters? So, I mean, what you would have normally is that, uh, I mean, 
before the group commit. So is that you, every thread, every thread that's committed, it will be in a queue, yeah. right? And then you, you you will commit them in sequence because it's uh, then you only do the six so they stand there in the queue and they're waiting. All, the only thing we do, like, if you look at it from a, a conceptual perspective, the only thing you do is every time you commit, <coughs> there's a queue. Everyone is included into one operation. Everyone who is waiting becomes one operation. But that's really, if, if, I mean, the basics. That's all, the only thing I've done. So, so the implementation will be exactly the same if you never have a queue, because there's only one. He will do his effort. If there's many, they will do it. In, I mean, it's just instead of having a sequence which uh, one you do this one, then you go back to the next one. You take them into one operation. You combine them into one operation. All the commits. I mean, it's not. It's the f-sync. I mean, it's the disk sync of the commits. So in theory, well, it could make the ones who are first in the queue could be a tad slower than what they were before, because now they're included in a large operation. But, but the point here, of course, in queues is, is in, the throughput is 50 times faster. So that, and that's what the, you care about. It's not the individual transaction. If it's a few milliseconds slower, if you get 50 times through the throughput, which you do. Uh, the, look at the fa if you're interested in this, look at the Facebook benchmarks, just for seeing the, uh, the how much better throughput you get in the group. I actually have it in a different. Well, I can show you if you're interested. I can show you just. I have it in a, a different slide set. So. There. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. So the blue, the blue one is the MariaDB. Uh, the yellow is MySQL 5.5. Uh, the red is a Facebook patch, which no longer exists because they used, they took the MariaDB. If you, when you start going to you see 64 concurrent users, mm -hmm. they get 28,000 uh, uh, transactions per second, mm -hmm. whereas the MySQL is around 5,000 per second. Yeah, it's so it's a good improvement. <coughs> and then it kind of stays steady. And well, they did the benchmark for, for uh, several different types of disks, so it also, of course, depends on, depends on the disk speed. Mm -hmm. uh, but I took the one with to actually least improvements. I think there was another one where it was even the difference is even, even even bigger. Yeah, there's one more where the difference is bigger where they compare because Facebook has two versions of the patch. And when we release ten, well the next ten zero to the alpha should have another version of group comment that's much faster. Mm -hmm. But we try to do this benchmark this against the group comment in five six because they have a different algorithm and implementation. They have a different initial design and then Followed closely to our older design now, but it's different from maybe Dave can answer. So it's binary. So, so the problem is if you look at uh, NBB, I'll go back to my other slide. I have a, actually have a. Uh, so if you look at InnoDB, actually here I have the disk optimizations anyway. Index condition push and multi-range route optimization. Uh, but if you look at the group commit, so I mean, if you look at InnoDB, right, so uh, in InnoDB you have, uh, uh, so you have the stuff on disk, right, the, the actual the disk pages and all that, all that crap. That you, you, and, but then you have the buffer pool and all your changes you write in the buffer pool, right, because, because whatever, I mean, memory is much faster. Uh, and in order to be durable when you commit, you have to write something to this, right? Otherwise, you, you have a crash and your transaction is gone. And of course, writing these pages all randomly is not a good thing, so instead you write the read -along. That's the basic, right? In read it's sequential, so you write it in a circle and you don't do random jumps on a disk and all that stuff. So, and it's small, it's small things you write. So you, instead of, when you commit, you have to write your read along to this. Right? And that's in a DB. The problem with MySQL is that there's also the binary log, which is uh, the log that's used for incremental backups, for replication and things like that, which, which uh, has to be synced also, right? So, you, so when, you, when you commit, you, not, you don't only write the read log, but you have to write to the binary log as well, and these writes have to be synced. And the way it's done is that you pretty much have to do three F-syncs to do this. You, do, you write one, you write the other, and then you write 
first one again, kind of, to make sure if something crashes at any stage, they will always be synced. And, as you, and that kind of creates a huge well, IO problem if you have a lot of concurrent transactions coming. Does that answer your question? Okay, so it's still, so even... This, so is, this is without the group commit. I, I mean, when you put the group commit, all you do is that instead of having the queue done one transaction by transaction, you do them as one, you treat everyone in the queue as one transaction. Okay, but what, I, what I'm calling is like writing the same location on disk. No, it's different. Yeah. Because the reader log and the binary log. Okay, so the storage engine has its own log in the file itself. And that's why why it's a problem because you know, I mean that's why it wasn't done before because you have to you have to actually assume things. So would it be possible to do something that the binary log is somehow it, to only like one of them is a side effect. So like one thing is sometimes it falls like this. You can actually regenerate them by replaying transactions. Well so the problem is that you might have uh, so InnoDB is the main storage engine, but you have still you have stuff going on on the server that's not in InnoDB, yeah. and that's why you need both of them kind of. Yeah. All right. So the reader log is storage engine independent. Mm -hmm. So whatever you put in reader, I'm sorry, not the binary log. Yeah. Whatever you put in binary log can be used to recreate stuff in InnoDB, but it could go anywhere pretty much. You can even use it for another. So you can use it for whatever Postgres and theory. It's like it's like row operations. So it could be anything. So that's why it's storage and independent. Read log is completely in a database. But I mean, it's no longer, it's done. I mean, it's done. It exists this feature, so it's no longer a problem. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, and, well, the next thing is my engineering defense. So, Mysql 5.6 became GA in February, and as I said, they changed a lot in, in the way that I mean, things were done, I mean, which stuff was in which file, which file and stuff, and really we decided, okay, we're not going to re-merge everything from Maria into 5.6, we're going to take features from 5.6 into Maria 10.0 instead. And I, I actually wrote a blog about kind of a feature comparison, what's in 5.6, what's in Maria 10 right now, so you can look at my blog. Thank you for calling the process.